watching NRA TV with Grant Stinchfield. Hi there, folks. Welcome to the program. By now, you have heard of the Islamic sickos arrested out in New Mexico for running a terrorist training camp. Outrage is growing at the judge's stunning decision to allow the release of all five suspects on bond. She knew the allegations. The men are accused of training children to be the nation's next set of school shooters, all in the name of Allah. She also knew detectives found the body of a toddler on the compound. Remains, really, a young boy that should have been evidence enough to keep them all in custody. But no, she decided to give them the opportunity to let them go. Now, word is that toddler would have been four on the day his body was discovered. His father, Siraj Wahaj, is said to have kidnapped him from Georgia, telling the boy's mother he was taking him to the park the two never returned. That alone leaves me shaking my head how this judge would release this clan. The prosecutor insists Siraj Wahaj and the five other adults put the boy through some kind of demonic ritual to drive out evil spirits. That ritual, they say, led to his death. Now the positive identification of the boy. The judge needs to order the Muslim extremists held in custody, demand it. God forbid they carry out the plans federal investigators feared they were plotting. An ISIS fighter is now in custody for the murder of an Iraqi police officer. He was captured not in Baghdad, but in Sacramento. In 2014, the Obama State Department granted the known terrorist refugee status. Apparently, no one bothered to dig too deep into the background of Omar Amin. How did he get into the country? It was easy. He simply lied on his United Nations applications for refugee status. And America welcomed him in with open arms. His capture is putting the spotlight back on the flaws of the refugee system. For far too many refugees, or people who just claim to be refugees, there is no ability to check the background of who wants to come here, potentially putting all of us in danger. President Trump initially listed Iraq as one of the countries on his travel ban. Iraq has since been removed. The Daily Caller has been on the forefront of reporting on this story. They revealed in a recent piece that Amin was allegedly a member of ISIS. But in 2004, before the rise of that brutal terror group, Amin and his family helped start AQI. Al-Qaeda in Iraq. That from the DOJ. In addition to allegedly killing an Iraqi police officer, Amin is suspected of planning IEDs and committing terrorist acts near his hometown of Rawa. The DOJ apparently knew of Amin's terror ties, yet Amin appears not to have faced any rigorous questioning from the U.S. Government talks about terror links and his criminal activities. Not asked about any of it. Instead, he simply answered no to questions about his alleged ISIS and al-Qaeda links. This goes to the heart of the liberal fantasy world policies that they push. They rely on the wish that evil doesn't exist and no one will lie. We know that evil does exist and people do lie. Remember this. One terrorist could kill hundreds of Americans. Hundreds. Yet liberals continue to want to put Americans at risk. You and me, our families by pushing ultra-liberal policies like the refugee program that allowed Amin to enter America unchecked. I ask, when will these liberal Democrats learn their lesson? The answer, sadly, they have proven, is never. Joining me now is the president for the uh, American Islamic Forum for Democracy, Dr. Zudi Jasser. Uh, doctor, great to have you on the program. It's great to be with you, Grant. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Doctor, look, you, you were a Navy man, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, so, sir, served 11 years. So thank you for that, first off. Uh, but look, that gives you a, a unique perspective on what's going on in the world and our quest to push back. Um, this is a battle that I do believe that is going to be going on for a very long time. The question now becomes, can radical jihad actually be beaten or is this a fight that we will be facing for, for, for eternity? Well, I think, you know, I also have shared uh, and I run a, an American Islamic Forum for Democracy, which we founded after 9-11. And we founded it with the mission not to fight terrorism, but to fight political Islam. Because just as in the Cold War, while the Soviet Union was a symptom of communism, the core ideology we were fighting and still are fighting in Cold War 2.0 is communism and socialism. So ultimately, jihadism will never go away until we Muslims separate mosque and state until we defeat the idea of the Islamic State. The New Mexico compound case you cited, what's amazing, and one of the reasons the liberal media is not covering this case is because the grandfather, Siraj Wahaj Sr., is a major player in almost every 
major American Islamic organization. He's on the board of the Council on American Islamic Relations. He's on the Islamic Society of North America. In my book, A Battle for the Soul of Islam, I talk about how the only meeting of the Islamic Society I went to in, in a national meeting, Siraj Wahaj Sr., whose son ran this, holds up the Quran and says it is our role as American Muslims to change the constitution with the Quran because we believe in an Islamic state. Now, a lot of word is that his grandfather helped find this compound, helped the FBI and authorities, but we are in major denial as a country if we believe, if we ignore the fact that his father's separatism was a gateway drug to the radicalization and the militancy of his children and his grandchildren. All right, so Siraj Wahaj Sr., for crying out loud, he was a character witness for the blind sheik. You don't get any worse than this guy. Yep, and, and the testimony, he said he was a great guy and all this kind of stuff. Now, he'll say that, well, ultimately his testimony ended up convicting him because he cited his, his uh, 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 report of stealing money and other things. But at the end of the day, he's anti-American. He's a separatist. This is like saying that uh, a, a, a alcoholic has nothing to do with his son who goes out and becomes a drunk driver and kills hundreds on the road. So there is a gateway drug. There is a radicalism problem, which isn't just terrorism. We have more than a whack-a-mole problem, which is what our homeland security is doing. And even with that whack-a-mole problem, as you mentioned in the ISIS case, we're ignoring ideology. All we deal with is, are they a member of al-Qaeda? We need to look at, do they believe in political Islam? Do they believe in an Islamic state concept? If they do, they shouldn't have any business coming to the United States. Yeah, and that gets us to the other big fear is that, I mean, it's not even a fear because it's reality. We know that that, that kind of thinking is being bred here in the United States. You could go to areas of Detroit and truthfully probably any major American city and find that way of thinking, correct? Absolutely, and this is why if we're gonna defeat jihadism, we have to stop the left, you know, on the left, they've got what I call the red-green axis between the communist socialists and the Islamists. They're both collectivists. They hate liberty, they hate conservatism, and they're working against who we are as a country. And if we're gonna defeat that, we have to expose the dots, the connected dots between, you know, uh, Islamists like the Council on American Islamic Relations and radicals like San Bernardino, Boston bombing, this New Mexico compound, on and on, there is a dots that are connected that we are ignoring in the conveyor belt of radical jihad that is part of right now our pre-modern interpretation of most of our faith in Islam that needs to go through a deep reformation and nobody wants to acknowledge that. Why do you think there are so few Muslims like yourself that are willing to speak up against radical jihad? I, I've always, and I'm a firm believer that the more Muslims, we get to speak out against this, and I don't do not mean the Council for uh, American Islamic Relations with their connections to the Muslim Brotherhood. That whole thing's a sham, and the mainstream media plays right into them. But but good, upstanding, law-abiding American Muslims to speak up and say, "Hey, we do not tolerate this." Well, Grant, here's the analogy I want to use for your viewers. President Trump came to be because he fought the establishment. The problem we have in the Muslim community globally is the establishment. Almost every Muslim majority country is run by a mafia dictator of some kind, and we have no voice because it's not only a domestic problem, but a global problem. So it's time for America to start taking the sides of the people on the streets of Iran, which President Trump is doing as Bolton and Pompeo are doing, to take the sides of the people in prisons of Saudi Arabia, the prisons of Egypt, et cetera. And especially in America where we can do this work, Unfortunately, most of the voices for the Islamic community are paid lobbyists for foreign governments that want to, to weaken America rather than to empower Muslim reformers. Our Muslim reform movement has a website, muslimreformmovement.org. I would ask people to look at that declaration on the website. There are 15 organizations and thousands of Muslims that are beginning to work on this, but we are really just a drop in the ocean and we don't get the attention that we should in media domestically and abroad. So here's my fear, and, and it sounds easy to go and try to get the support of those people that are being persecuted by their governments. But, I, and this is a very rough experiment, but there is a social media site called Periscope 
uh, and people can go on and you can actually talk back and forth to people in other countries and, and including our own country here. I will go on there on occasion and I will try to communicate with people in places like Iraq and, and Yemen uh, and Syria and Turkey and all of these places. And I ask them, what are your feelings about America? And in my own little research, 90% of the people that I talk to talk about hating America, and then I'm instantly blocked when they see I'm an American. Well, I'd have to tell you that a lot of the times if they have access to social media and international uh, uh, connections on the internet, they're going to have, de I mean, if you look in Saudi Arabia, 90% of the Twitter activity is the Wahhabis that are sympathetic to the government, while the 10% that are liberals are the ones who are put in jail by the regime there. If you look in, in the streets in Iran, they're actually chanting death to the dictator that they love America, they love what Pompeo is doing. So I would be careful. I, I know you, you recognize that your sample might not be the greatest. And I would tell you, you're right. We have not had, right now, the Islamic movements, the Muslim Brotherhood has had, as, as uh, um, Woolsey said, who was the former head of the CIA, they've had a $100 billion head start in their information operation against the West. So a lot of their population is going to be anti-American. We need to have a forward evangel evangelism, if you will, of liberty abroad to begin to resurrect the U.S. information agency, to begin to advocate for freedom, because for too long our country has only said we're against terrorism, we're against violence. Thankfully, the Trump administration has ended, their, ended the CVE program, which is countering violent extremism, because just countering something is not enough. What are we for? So we have to work with on the ground with folks that share our values. And yes, the beginning is going to be tough, but just like treating cancer, sometimes the patient will get sicker before they get better. Yeah, I agree with you. I do think a, a lot of it is about information out and getting it out there because I, I believe, and the president is doing it, that Al Qaeda and ISIS can certainly be, be defeated, at least the warriors that they have fighting for them now. The problem stems from the children that are being born into households that push exactly what you say about calls for an Islamic state and intense uh, ultra Sharia law and those kind of things. And it is going to be generational as those kids grow up. We've got to figure out a way to reach them. Uh, but look, we've got to figure out a way to reach our youth in inner cities, too, uh, as far as with the violence going on there. So clearly, doctor, we have our work cut out for us. We sure do. And I think, you know, right now the pieces are being put into place. We need a strategy that's short and long term. Short term, we've seen with the command and control of ISIS being taken away finally by the DOD and this president, uh, their information has decreased and the acts of terror have decreased. But that is a Band-Aid. The symptom over the long term, as you said, is generational. And we need to empower those who share our values in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Hey, Dr. Jasser, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming on. Fascinating conversation. I hope I'll get you on again soon. Anytime, Grant. Thank uh -huh. you. You're watching NRA TV with Grant Stinchfield.